Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending March 17th, 2018. First up, I imagine everybody's heard about it, the tragedy of the Florida walkway bridge collapsing and the uh, six lives lost. I'm going to basically talk about the engineering part of it. Uh, of course, everybody has great sympathy for the families of the loved ones lost, but since this is a science show, I'm going to concentrate on the science and the engineering. If we can do anything for a legacy of these people, we can at least work on finding out what caused it and make sure it never does happen again or if it does happen again it's as unlikely as possible so um, I'm gonna put some links down here too there's a channel called AVE and this guy kinda deconstructs certain things and he's a pretty logical thinker um, the way his channel runs it's not necessarily because of his uh, salty language is probably not safe uh, for work kinda channel so probably listen to it when you're off the job and uh, so anyway um, the, the important thing if you do watch the video is um, also go down to the comments below because a lot of people in bridge engineering and bridge building made a lot of comments that um, gave me a vast knowledge now more than I had before about bridges and construction. Now I've been involved in uh, about three different major construction projects in uh, water treatment so um, some of these safety practices and some of the things I'm familiar with but as far as bridge building I'm not familiar with that but I can at least use a little bit of my knowledge from safety practices and stuff like that and at least tell you what I think about it based on the the comments and the video from AVE and as usual all the links to all the stories I'll be talking about will be down below in the description box so first let's talk about the design of the bridge now I can't really see where you could say that there are any there are likely to be any faults in the design because there are about 800 bridges that are similar to this very design. So, and the Fig Engineering people that designed it, according to the people that were commenting on AVE and other stuff I've read, they're probably about the one of the best design firms in the business. So, if they give you a bridge design and you follow their specs and build it the way they say, it's going to be a reliable bridge and it won't fall down. Now, obviously, this one fell down, so we have to look beyond design and let's look at the method of construction. Now this was a prefab type of bridge too to where it was made in big huge sections off site and then moved into site and this was one of the biggest sections I think in the world of this type of bridge ever moved into site across eight lanes of traffic. Um, one thing when you're moving prefab uh, sections into the spot they could be stressed during the moving if you don't support them right. They could be jolted by the placement and a lot of guys that were in bridge building and engineers said that that could have been a possibility too that you could have seen damage and being uh, placed and being put in place and uh, I noticed myself that this was something I thought was a possibility that I got totally wrong I guess according to the other people uh, the tower and the cables for the the visible cables up above uh, the suspension cables were missing and they hadn't installed them yet and I thought well maybe it lost a lot of strength because of that according to them this type of bridge does not need those cables to actually hold itself up this bridge is built more than strong enough to hold itself up on its own and the cables and tower are more for the purpose of uh, dampening the oscillation so there is no need if this bi if uh, this bridge could easily be built without those so um, I don't know if they did in this case more for a visual thing or they thought because of the way it was shaped that they needed to dampen the oscillations but evidently this bridge did not need the uh, to be suspended from cables it was strong enough if built properly and put in place properly it was built strong enough to do it on its own now when we always did construction where I worked there was test samples of all kinds of things pretty much any material they used I was, I was one of the people who were taking test samples of cement and then bringing them back to the engineering you also take test samples probably of all the metals pretty much anything that goes in the bridge test samples of the cable you have to cut a section bring it to the engineers so they can test it and make sure everything meets the specifications as far as especially strength to be able to do the job because if you uh, you know use inferior products it's not going to be the strength that the design calls for if so um, but even then the bridge engineers and the guys that built it in the comments say they have seen projects even with all the testing to where they've still ended up having a weak spot in the bridge that had to be fixed later. Uh, one guy mentioned too that even with all the cement testing uh, he built a bridge himself that had a soft spot in the middle and it had to basically be uh, I don't know jackhammered out or removed and redone the right way but uh, even that can happen even with all the testing and everything so. Uh, I'm wondering too was there pressure to keep all lanes of traffic open they had 174 foot span with no middle supports in it and so that's a lot to ask of something that's a long span uh, with no supports there to help it out and especially when you get to tensioning it now 
they had a crane during the tensioning process. They were still allowing traffic to go underneath, uh, tensioning these cables and putting them under huge stress. Um, and they were allowing uh, these cars and stuff and pedestrians to, to go underneath it. And I'm thinking myself, every time we've ever used cables and tensioned cables in construction, we were told that every person other than necessarily people, necessary people um, that can be a little bit closer, we had to be two or three times the length of the cable away from the thing because uh, I've heard horror stories of cables snapping and people being beheaded, bodies cut in half. And uh, although the cables they were tensioning in this case were uh, enclosed in, underneath in tubes in the roadway themselves, they were to help do the compression for the construction of the, uh, for the cement to keep it in uh, the most strength possible. Uh, cement does not like to, it likes to, to be under compression loads but it doesn't like to be under flexing loads or pulling apart loads. So you use these tensioning cables to uh, kind of pull the concrete together. And they were doing this while still allowing traffic underneath. And they, what they did was they used a crane hook, you know, a crane and a hook uh, in the middle part to kind of help support it while they were doing this too and give the bridge extra support. But guys looking at the pictures say it looked to them like the crane hook had either snapped or been pulled straight. And so the bridge did while these cables were being tensioned, it lost all the support of the crane itself. Now, did it lose support because the bridge started collapsing or did the bridge start collapsing because it lost the support of the crane? It's probably one or the other. I don't know which it could have been. So um, basically, they, I think in the future what it's going to be is they're probably going to have some kind of law or something like that of whenever you're doing tensioning of a bridge that you probably can't have anybody except necessary personnel around um, within maybe three times the length of the cable itself. Uh, by myself, whenever they were tensioning a cable myself, I got like three times or more away from it too because if the thing snaps and then snaps again, you even have a cable itself flying through the air, flying towards you. So I always got as far away as possible and hopefully inside a structure or something like that uh, besides that. So um, I think there's going to be some changes in the laws of construction. I think with a span like this of 174 feet unsupported, that's just not going to happen anymore in the future. I think when you're doing the construction of a bridge like that or any type of a structure that has 174 foot span while it's under construction will have to have some kind of temporary supports in there even if it ends up blocking a couple of lanes of traffic and my sense is they probably should have just you know in hindsight hindsight's always 2020 they probably should have just blocked all of traffic for um, from coming under during the tensioning process itself so there's several links below check out the links I've also got a video um, was caught on it looks like a little closed circuit camera was maybe half a block away that actually caught the collapse itself as it happened. So if you get a chance, check that video out and uh, leave any comments down below. Like I said, I'm not, I've just been around construction and did a little bit with it, but never anything to do with bridges. But if you just read the comments on the AVE video, you're going to get a lot of information that you didn't know about bridges before. I certainly got an education out of it. Next up from IFL Science. U.S. company in big trouble after launching four satellites without permission. I'd actually talked about this before, um, this, um, these satellites in the future of it in one of the past TDD reports. I couldn't tell you exactly which one of it, but a U.S. company appears to have gone rogue and launched a fleet of satellites into orbit despite not having permission as they could endanger other satellites. The startup company from California is called Swarm Technologies, founded in 2016 by former, former Google and Apple engineers. And on uh, January 12, 2018, the secretive company launched its first four satellites called Space Bees on a polar satellite launch vehicle rocket from the Indian Space Agency along with 30 other satellites. They did not contact the Federal Communication Commission in the U.S., which provides accreditation for American launches. Previously, They previously had denied the company a launch license. It appears they launched their satellites without approval. The real problem with these satellites is they're so small they can't be easily tracked and we need some kind of way to track these. Now they claim that it put out a signal that these satellites put out a signal that you could use to track them but suppose the satellites die and you lose the signal being that these satellites are so small about the size of a, a medium sized book I guess and maybe about three or four times as thick um, these things would just be zipping through space and if they collided I mean something as small as a marble colliding with another satellite can be devastating. These things if they were to collide with any other type of satellites or anything like that, it would be a, a horrible disaster. They would just totally destroy it and then create so much more space debris. So um, there's a real reason to actually get approval before um, you launch something like this. So. And it says right here, Swarm apparently installed GPS devices in the satellites that would broadcast their position. However, the FCC said this was not enough, noting that the satellites, if the satellites were not functional, the GPS data would not be available. So 
Um, they, for this article, the FCC declined requests for an interview. Um, they don't know from now on what they're going to do about this, if they're going to be able to stop them from future launches or anything like that. This is all kind of up in the air, but they got those four satellites up in there going around. And once they die, I don't know. Maybe maybe they're going to be able to improve tracking better to be able to, to what they usually do if they if a satellite is big enough and they know it's dead and they can track it, they can have other satellites actually move a little bit to the side and avoid collision. But with these things being so small, what can you do? And last up, uh, a genius passed away on uh, March 14th. That's as a matter of fact, uh, that's Albert Einstein's birthday, and Stephen Hawking passed away. He was only supposed to live to be in his mid-20s and lived to be 76 years old. And I've got an article here that's kind of interesting from sciencefriday.com. I've got one link to the article about Stephen Hawking and then one link if you want to actually check out the whole show. I would encourage you to. It's a PBS show, but you can listen to it just by uh, go to sciencefriday.com and you can listen to the segments as uh, podcasts or just audio downloads. But uh, they asked Stephen Hawking back in 2013. PBS asked him some questions in the transcript, and uh, I'll just go over one of them here that's kind of interesting, but they were asking him if he was to uh, uh, start, out, start out again, uh, restart in life, would he still pursue uh, the career that he's got, the the career in physics that he has now, or would he uh, choose something different if he was starting over? And Stephen Hawking said, if I were starting research now, I might study uh, molecular biology, the science of life. So can you imagine what the world would be like if Stephen Hawking would have chosen molecular biology rather than physics. He was the one that um, came up with the theory that black holes can evaporate and actually eventually poof out of existence. So would physics still be the same? I doubt it. Uh, had he been a biologist, would it be that he would have been just an average or maybe above average biologist and not really had any breakthroughs? Or would he have uh, maybe found a cure for cancer or something like that with the big, as big a genius as he is? Would he have really given something to biology? Who knows, you know? You never know when you... Uh, are kind of predicting a, a do-over like that, but if you get a chance, check out those links too. We've lost a, a real genius in science with Stephen Hawking uh, being gone, so may he rest in peace. Anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you. Oh, also, I want to give a shout-out too. Thank you, um, Muzzle Mike in the ITL for a shout-out in his uh, ITL report that he does every week. He posts his on a Saturday, usually, early in the morning, and uh, then I do my show on Sunday, so we both have weekly shows. Uh, thank you, Muzzle Mike, for the shout-out, and check out his show and his channel, and I will put a link to that down in the description below. So take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.